everybody doing today? Thank you all so much for being here. I want to say happy Father's Day to all of the dads out there. Um, may you be showered with love and affection today. Um, we get our model for being a father from our God. Did you know that? He models how we should be as parents and how we should be as a father. And we are just so thankful that God is our father this morning. Let's stand together and sing. We're going to worship. We're going to sing. Our first song is called Egypt. And I love this song because it says, God says, I will make a way for you. I am fighting your battles. Did you know that prayer is the best medicine? God always says, trust in my timing. My timing and my way is perfect. And that's what I want to sing about this morning, okay? Go ahead and join us as we sing Egypt. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my
Give God a hand clap. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Journey Community Church. Uh, it's one of those things where like Mother's Day, that place is packed, and on Father's Day, everybody's out fishing, right? <laughs> That's just what we do, all right? But hey, uh, so glad you guys are here. Um, we got a few special treats for the dad, for the men. Um, one of them, I just thought I would point it out. Uh, where's Bella at? Is she in here? She's serving this morning? Okay, she's somewhere serving. That's what I love about that girl. She's made all the dad's cookies and a little happy Father's Day uh, gift as well. So if you see Bella walking around, absolutely give her a hand. She's not in here. I don't know where she went. She may be serving upstairs, but uh, I love when people do that. So uh, dads, happy Father's Day. Glad you guys are here. Uh, we do have a special gift for you when you leave and just a, a special Sean gift. How about that? All right. And we'll just, we'll just leave it at that. All right. Some of you are like, does it have to do with food? It might just don't worry about it. All right. Oh. <laughs> might have to do with beef and sticks and stuff like that. I don't know. So tacos. Yes. I'm saving all those for me, Camilla. I don't share those, but Hey, we're, we're really glad you guys are here. Um, if you're a guest this morning, would you fill out one of our connection cards during the seat right there in front of you? It just helps us to be able to get to know you better. Uh, we would like to send you a little gift in the mail just saying thanks for being here. And then uh, we, we don't, we're not going to do anything weird with that. But that's all we ask out of our guests, guests. We don't ask them to give financially. We just think that's something our members and attenders should do. Um, so, but if you would do that for us, that'd be great. But I want to invite you to um, introduce yourself to somebody that you don't know. And here's why. Um, I didn't grow up in church. And so I don't like all the traditional things that a lot of traditional churches do and the handshake thing's always been one of those things I've just been like oh, I'm just not a fan of it but then I realized over the last few months as we've been in this building most of the, well a lot of people are new and so everybody the new people are looking around like everybody knows each other and they don't know me and nobody's talking to me truth is really a lot of people don't know anybody all right so <laughs> let's fix that that's why we do all these fellowship events ladies events men's events uh, married night out all these things that we do they're to get us to be a one big body, all right? So take a minute, get to know somebody that you don't know already, and then we'll continue to worship. <laughs> also share his suffering and you know that's true about life because as Sean spoke last week on suffering and trials 
You know, sometimes life is just hard, and that's where we need his word, and we need prayer, and we need a community of believers to gather around us and help us to get through those rough times. But this next song that we're going to sing, it's called Set Free. And, you know, it's one thing to be set free when you become a Christian, but did you know that you can still have bondage and really hard times even as a believer God wants you to give all of those burdens to him amen so I want you to just pray in your spirit this morning because we worship God in spirit and in truth there's anything that you need to give over to the Lord I just want you to give it to him today as we sing this song set free okay thank you guys so much for being here Jesus. 
I just want to say thanks to my little girl, Aaliyah Marie. She is singing today Woo! for her daddy for Father's Day. It's a girls' week up here, and we are having so much fun worshiping with you guys. Well, Brandon, you're a girl today. <laughs> oh, Marty. Well, you know, I meant the pro girls. <laughs> All right, this next one we're going to do is called Peace Be Still. And I just pray that the peace of our God just washes over you this morning as you worship him. Amen. Sing this one with us. Peace be still. We don't, we're not going to be afraid because he is in control. Amen.
God, you are such a good God. We are so thankful that you love us in a mighty way. Thank you for going after us and leaving the 99 to save the one. Bless your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, let's start off a, a little different this morning. Um, I want to I wanna take just a couple minutes and just spend some time praying, all right? Because um, prayer is one of those things that, that it keeps us, I say it keeps us in check, keeps us humble, it keeps us focused where our focus needs to be, right? And so there's a lot of things going on in our church right now, a lot of people going through some things. And so I just want to pray over those things just to give you kind of a quick update um, so one family in our church, Mike and Teresa, if you know Mike and Teresa, uh, were involved in an accident on vacation in Florida, and Mike spent a few days in the ICU, and Teresa had some head trauma. They're back home now. They've, they've made the drive home, and uh, they are home and resting and doing well, and so we want to lift them up in prayer. It's actually amazing. Uh, another family from our church happened to be in the exact same city while they were there and tried to go see them in the hospital, and things didn't work out, and they couldn't get connected, but it was amazing that they reached out from our prayer uh, email chain and were like, hey, what city are they in in Florida? Maybe we, we're, we're close to them. Turned out to be the exact same city. It's pretty cool. Um, and so, so God is never caught off guard, right? Uh, and then Mackenzie Harold, who's our preschool director uh, down here, was here last week doing our, our baby dedicate, or uh, parent commissioning. Um, she, uh, she had her uh, appendix rupture and had some infection leak into her abdomen. She had surgery. She's doing well, but they're going to keep her in the hospital for a few days. Uh, giving her some antibiotics, making sure that doesn't get a little crazy. Um, and then I just went blank. There was one more specific thing I wanted to pray about this morning. Uh, hold on, my brain. Man, I don't remember what it was. I just literally just had it in my head. Oh, well, God knows, right? All right. So let's just take a minute and uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, we're incredibly grateful for how much you love us. Uh, thank you, God, that we can come and we can worship you. Thank you, God, that we can come before you and lay all of our cares at your feet, knowing that you are gonna be the one who takes care of those things, knowing that you go to battle for us. Even though these waves seem like they're deep, God, they're not, they're just waves. And so thank you that we don't have to fear these storms that we go through. And so we lift up Mike and Teresa to you, Lord. We're thankful for the protection you gave them. Even though they did suffer injuries, God, we're thankful it wasn't worse. We're thankful that they're home. We're thankful that they're resting, God. And I just pray you'd give them peace while they rest and they heal and uh, provide every need that they have. I pray for Mackenzie, Lord, as she recovers from surgery and as she um, fights this infection. Uh, God, just, just wipe it away. Just clean it. Just get it, get it gone. Uh, we pray for Pastor Owsley, Lord. Um, I know he and his family are going through a lot right now. Um, and so, Lord, you've been so gracious to him. Just continue to be gracious, God, to him and his family. Thank you for his ministry. And I just pray, God, that everything that we go through, spoken, unspoken, that you would do some amazing work there. We love you. We pray all this in the powerful name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, one of the things uh, for me that has been different over the last few years is um, a, a job that I got into, something I've always enjoyed, but uh, got into it 
um, professionally, uh, which is medical, EMS, doing stuff like that. And I can remember um, a few years ago, I went on this call. And on this call, uh, it was a little tr- minor traffic accident, really not a big deal at all. Uh, did some damage to the front of this man's truck, and he was an older gentleman. And so we got there, and we checked him out. And, you know, we, we had some minor concerns, like, hey, you really need to go to the hospital and get checked out. And he was like, okay. He told us what hospital he wanted to go to, and we're like, okay. And so we get him loaded. We get him in the medic, and we do a further assessment in the medic. If you ever have somebody go to the hospital and they put them in the ambulance, the ambulance sits there for like 15 more minutes and you're like, what's going on? What's wrong? Nothing. They're just further assessment, making sure we've caught everything, right? So upon further assessment, we noticed that he had some dissension in his belly and it was like, that wasn't normal. And we were like, hey, we really think there may be something more going on than what we see and we want to take you to this trauma center. And long story short, he was dead set on, no, I'm not going to the trauma center. I want to go to my hospital, blah, blah. Well, if there is more going on, you know, they're not going to be able to help you. We really need to take you to the trauma center. Don't want to go to the trauma center. I want to go to my hospital. Okay, you're the boss. We have to take you where we want to take you. And uh, we got a call from the EMS coordinator the next day. and goes, hey, remember that, that accident you brought in? We're like, yeah. He's like, we got him in here and found an aortic tear in his heart from that accident. And he was bleeding out. We flew him to the trauma center and it was too late. And uh, he was walking around talking, and within six hours, he was dead. And it, it, it kind of blows my mind, and we, we, we look at that, and we think, man, that, that's, that's crazy. Like, that's abnormal. But the truth is, we are a lot of the same way sometimes. We may be walking and talking, and all of our organs are acting the way they work, but inside, we've got, we're, we're, we're dead inside. We're, we're hurting. We, we, we don't think anybody else sees it. We don't think anybody else understands it. And so even though all of our organs may be intact, the spirit has been crushed. And I see that time and time and time again. And that's what Peter begins to address as we move in to chapter 5. We've seen that in the recent weeks with Naomi Judd. You know, bubbly and great on the outside, but inside just a mess. And we see that time and time again. And so the book of 1 Peter is this reminder for Christians not to lose hope in those times. We all go through times of suffering. We all go through this. I know I sound like a broken record because I say it every week. But for the last eight weeks, we've been talking about how we as Christians suffer well. And so if you've got your Bible with you, I want you to open up to the very last chapter of 1 Peter, chapter 5. And we're going to walk through that, um, the 11 verses. And you may be going, oh, we're at the end. We're not. I saved chapter 4 for the very last week. All right? if, you, if you pay attention, I skipped over the first half of chapter 4 two weeks ago. And some of you may have caught it. I was like, why did he just skip all that? I'm saving it for the last week because I think it brings everything together. Um, but we've been, we've been learning that God uses suffering. And we've learned that, that suffering can actually be profitable even though it's painful. Even though it hurts, even though we don't like it, even though we don't want to go through it. But here's the question that I want us to focus on in this last chapter. How do we get from the pain to the profit? If, if pain can be profitable, how do we get to that point where it becomes profitable? profitable? Because it, it's been like this elusive path, right? It gets to this point where uh, we know we suffer, we know it hurts, but if we don't get to the profit, if we don't get to the, the, the payoff, then we're left being broken or bitter. We get discouraged. We get depressed. All these emotions begin to set in. And so I've titled this message, Getting to the Good Stuff. Because in Romans chapter 5, we hear things like, we also boast in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character. And proven character produces hope. But if that is true, then why do we never make it to the end of that verse? Why do we get to the point where we don't find the hope? We don't get to that. And so let's get on this path and let's figure out how we make it profitable. Because practically speaking, how do we get the good stuff from suffering well that the Bible promises us? And so I think that we're going to see that here in chapter 5. Here's what Peter says. He says, I exhort the elders among you as fellow elder and witnesses. Sorry, I didn't set my timer, and that will make us here all day. All right? Uh, I exhort the elders among you as fellow elder and witnesses to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. Shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, 
not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And then, and when the chief shepherd appears, talking about Jesus, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. In the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the, night, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. To him be dominion forever. Amen. And so even though those words were written 2,000 years ago, those are still God's word for us today. And you read that and you go, well, th that's just for the pastors. He, he's, he's addressing the elders. But that's the first thing I want to address as we get into this is what does that look like? What is that? And so there's five steps that I want to call getting to the good stuff. All right. And number one is you find a guide. You find a guide. I would have chosen a different word, but the word he uses here is, is it's that, that they're guiding you through these times. And so let me, let me touch briefly on this. I think Peter's bulk of his teaching, as you can see it, come in verses 6 through 11. Uh, but I want to at least hit this part because I can't tell you how many times I've watched people get crushed by the suffering, get crushed by whatever it is they're going through, and they try to go at it alone. They try to say things, well, nobody else understands what I'm going through. Nobody else has experienced the pain that I've experienced. And that's just not true, especially in the church. Like, if the church is doing what it should do, yes, there'll be some who've had a great life, who've surrendered to the call of Jesus many, many years ago. But if the church is doing its job, it should have a whole crowd of people who were crushed, who came running to the church, who found hope in Christ in the church, who've been healed by their hurts, who've been healed by their past. And they can look at you and go, hey, I've been there. I know what that looks like. I've got scars too. I've got deep wounds as well. But for whatever reason, in our culture, when things get tough, what do we do? We run from church. I've seen it time and time and time again. I've got a really good friend who, who went through a very ugly accident, a very hard trial in his life. And the church was there for him and poured into him and, and was, was at his bedside in his house daily. And when he was healed, he just said, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Why would God let me go through that? And he walked away. It's heartbreaking. People distance themselves from other Christians when that's who we should be running towards. And so the question we've got to ask, is it them or is it me? Because if it's me, I can control that. If it's them, I can't control that. But look at verses 2 and 3. Shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. These words are addressed to the elders, the elders in the church. And the, the, the elders were kind of the top spiritual leaders in the church. Some churches today still have elders. It is my goal that one day the Journey Community Church will have elders, that we'll have the, these group of men that will help oversee the church. And you say, well, what, what is an elder? It, it's summarized really in one simple phrase, they help shepherd the flock. You're like, well, I thought that was the pastor's job. Well, the pastor's an elder. But do you really think that a pastor can shepherd the entire flock by himself? It doesn't happen, especially when you get into these larger churches of 200, 300, 400, 500 people. Good Lord, 1,000 people. How's one person going to shepherd that? They don't. And so you have elders. They oversee the flock. They, they do whatever the flock needs. Sometimes they teach. They, they get up here and they preach the word. If they need to give compassion, they give compassion. If there's somebody in need, they, they give to people in need. They, they counsel. They do whatever it needs done. In other words, they serve as a guide to those who are hurting. So step one is you've got to find a guide. 
You've got to find somebody who's going to walk you through that, who will help shepherd you through those times. But here's, here's the biggest reason we need to find a guide when we're entering suffering. Tell them I'm not available right now, but I'll call them later, all right? <laughs> Here it is. When you are going through a season of suffering, you're going to be incredibly tempted to make unwise and even sinful decisions to create some temporary relief of whatever it is you're going through. I've seen it time and time again. We could bring a microphone up here, and if people were brave enough, they could give testimony after testimony of just to get a little bit of relief, some of the stupid things that they've done. Because what we do, our human nature, our sinful side says, I have to engineer a way out of this situation. I have to figure out a way for me to get from where I'm at and get out of this instead of obeying God and trusting him with the results. And sometimes what we're really saying is, I don't know that I trust God that much. And instead of turning to the word and going, okay, Lord, speak to me, show me what it is I need to see. And then we see, oh, the shepherds, the, the, the elders, those are the ones that are supposed to take care of us. Let me run to them. Instead, what do we do? We run away. We try to engineer our own things because we, we get deceived by our own raging emotions. You've heard me preach against emotions a lot. We're emotional beings. God gave us emotions that are a good thing, but sometimes they lied to us. And that's the time that we need to run to a wise and mature guide who can objectively sort out the emotions that we're going through. Because let's just be honest, when we're in the thick of it, we don't think right. Our emotions are a lion to us. And so when life turns up the heat, run to the church. Don't run away from it. Here's the second step. Once you find a guide, humbly take their advice humbly take their advice the reason we don't run to these guides the reason we don't run to the church is because in our culture we've learned to say things like well i can handle this i'm smart i can read the bible i, I can read for myself i can inter- I, I know what's going on but all of those are warning signs that, that's the self-reliance that we begin to dig the hole into it begins to creep into our hearts and our minds that's why proverbs says there's safety in the multitude of counsel because you go and you talk to other people you learn that there's things that you're not seeing that maybe they see as they help you sort through all this but it takes humility takes the ability to be humble to place ourselves under the counsel of somebody else look at verse 5 In the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. You know why we have to practice humility? It's because humility doesn't come natural to anybody, does it, right? You ever heard that saying, oh, I'm the most humble person in the room, right? Well, you sure know it, don't you? (laughs) We, we all have to practice humility. It doesn't come natural. I love what D.L. Moody says. He says that he used to pray, Lord, make me humble, but don't let me know it. Because we get to this idea where we get humble, and even though we, we can't define it very well, we know humility when we see it. You, you know people who are very humble. They would put themselves last. They're not going to boast on themselves. That They're going to put other people before them. But we also know... <laughs> when there's people who don't have it. They're not humble. It's all about me, it's all about look right here, it's all about look what I did. And I would beg you to understand that humility comes from a proper understanding of God's grace. When we begin to understand what God's grace really looks like, that's when we begin to understand humility. Everything that we have comes from God, it's God's gifts to us. It's not ours, we don't own a thing here. Maybe on this earth we think we do, but, but in, in the realm of God's view, it's all God's. And nothing is earned. You didn't earn your salvation. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. And so it's all about humility. Not running yourself down or hiding your talents or feeling embarrassed about your gifts. Do you realize that every gift you had could have been given to somebody else? Do you realize that? When you start start talking about spiritual gifts and and taking spiritual gifts assessment, those gifts that God gave you, we're not supposed to boast about those. Those were given to us. And they could have been given to somebody else. And someday, we're going to give it all back. 
we're going to give an account for how we dealt with it. We're going to give an account for how we use the gifts that God gave us. And so I want you to see this and understand this, that when Peter says, clothe yourselves, he's using this very rare word in verse 6, or in verse 5. Clothe yourselves with humility. The word he uses describes the apron that a slave wore. It's the same garment that Jesus put on in John chapter 3 when he began to wash the disciples' feet. It was a garment worn by slaves. And that's what Peter tells us to do. We should put on this garment. We're not it. We're, we're slaves to Christ. Even though we've trusted Christ as our Savior, we talk about trusting him for everything. But when it comes right down to it, we really trust in ourselves. We really begin to trust in our own abilities that I can do, that I can fix that. And when life gets tough, when life gets hard, I can maneuver my way out of it. I do it too. We all do it. We, 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 we create plans of how we're going to get through this. We'll call on God for a little boost every now and then to get us through something. But we don't know what it means to, to cast ourselves on him, to clothe ourselves with humility. And sometimes we don't figure it out until he yanks the rug out from underneath us. I don't want you to end up there. I don't want to end up there. But sometimes we put ourselves there until God says, listen, I want you to be completely dependent on me. I don't want you worrying about everything else in the world. I don't want you to fixate on all these other things. I want you to worry about me, allow my grace to sustain you. So it's important to understand that God brings about certain things to test us, to purge us, to purify us. And we're not to be discouraged by those things. You're not to judge God as an unkind or unfair God. What does he say that we should do instead? Clothe ourselves with humility. Thank God when those times come. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem right. But that's what he says we should do. Clothe ourselves in humility. Here's number three. This is probably the hardest one. Don't stress about how it's going to turn out. I'm going to step aside and let somebody else come teach this part because I don't do this well, right? So if anybody is better than this, come up here. You can read my notes. But here's the things that we're, we're prone to doubt about God when we go through trials. And we talked about one of them last week. One of them is God's sovereign control over circumstances. We talked about the sovereignty of God. You remember that? It was last week or the week before. We, we defined that. We talked about what that looks like. And basically what we begin to say is, well, where is God in all this? 9-11, that, probably, that question probably got asked, asked more times than ever in our lifetime. Where was God? Where's God in all this chaos? Where's God in all this mess? And then we begin to doubt his concern for us. We begin to say things like, well, if God's in control and cares about me, then why is this happening? Why me? What does Paul say? He says, count it all joy when you go through trials. God chose you for that. God is draw, doing that to draw you near to him. And so Peter says that we must bow and acknowledge God's mighty hand, his sovereignty and his power. And so having acknowledged these two things, God's control and his care, then we cast our anxieties on him. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. This is a, a, a verse that we learned in my family many years ago, and my kids will still sing it, and I'll start to sing it as I read it. Don't worry about anything. The Easton's up there laughing already. But in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. It's about releasing anxiety. Look what Peter says here in verse 7. Casting all your cares on him. Why? Because he cares about you. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I wonder how many of the people in this room, that's the first time you've ever seen that written in Scripture. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But maybe you're sitting there like, I can cast my cares on him because it says right here that he cares about me. Un unload your worries on him. That word cast means to throw off with vigor. It's the picture of a football player running 80 yards for a touchdown and yanking his helmet off and, and wanting oxygen or whatever. 
I hear that happens. My cowboys, that never happens with them. But I hear in Cincinnati that takes place. I don't know. Go Zeke. Zeke lost it. Zeke doesn't know how to run anymore. He forgot. He waddles. Anyway, I digress. You, you get the picture of that? You, you, you see what I'm talking about? They just, they just, you've seen them just rip it off like, <sighs> that, that's what he's talking about. To, to, to get, it, get rid of it with, a, with vigor, casting all your cares on him. Dump it all. Don't, well, well, God, if, if, you're, if you're available today and you, you want to listen to me, I, I got this little problem. No, just go and dump it on him. And why? Because he cares about you. Unload your worries in the Lord. I promise you he's big enough to handle it. And the reason we can do it with confidence comes from those four simple words. He cares about you. Don't ever let Satan, and we're going to talk about this next, don't ever let Satan tell you that God doesn't care about you. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. Paul watched Christians get murdered, and he oversaw it to make sure they were dead dead, right? And yet he wrote most of the New Testament. Don't let anybody ever tell you that God doesn't care about you, that you've done too much for God to love you, because it's just not true. But what we end up doing is we think, well, if I trust God, if I give him everything, if I put all my cares on him, he's going to mess things up for me, right? He'll ask us to do things we don't want to do. He'll send me to foreign lands that I don't want to go to. He'll bring up unpleasant people in my life. He'll force me to, to be like somebody else I don't want to be. This is no joke. I grew up my whole life believing in God. I, was, I wasn't a Christian as a kid. I didn't grow up in church, but I believed in God. And I think I was kind of scared of God. But God was like my genie in a bottle. And uh, in junior high, I was a bit of a ladies' man. <laughs> I could tell you some stories. I had a new girlfriend like every two days. But there was this one girl in particular. I was in seventh grade. She was an eighth grader. I was moving up in the world. By the way, is my wife in here? No, she's not. When I was at, oh, okay. I was just going to say it's Father's Day and I love you. <laughs> When I was in seventh grade, my wife was a senior in high school. Bam! P called you out, didn't I? Told you I was a ladies' man. Anyway, I can't wait for y'all to see something in a couple weeks. I got a little gift I'm going to present her with here on stage in about two or three weeks. She has no idea what's coming. But anyway, I digress. But I remember one time praying, and I just said, God, I really like this girl. I don't remember her name. But I really like this girl, and so I'm not going to ask your help for this one because I want this one to work out. Y'all laugh at me, but you do it too. Amen. Normal, admit it. The rest of you are like, no, I don't. <laughs> you mean prove to you that you do it too? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know what the Bible says about this, but we've all said that, right? I know better than God. God, I trust you, but... There's certain things I just want to handle myself because I don't want you to screw this up for me. And we secretly fear that he can't be trusted to take care of us. So we decide I'm just going to handle it on my own. I'm just going to do this on my own. And Peter says, no, cast your cares upon him. And I'm convinced that probably our deepest issue is a theological issue. In Peter's terms, we've never settled the question of whether we believe that God really cares for us. We think he does, right? We hope he does. We hope he's, he's saving a place for us. We hope that we've, we, we are, we're truly saved when we, we prayed a prayer, we walked an hour, we did whatever we did. We, we really hope so, but many days we're not sure. And instead of casting our cares upon him, instead, we put all the weight on us. Because if for some reason that God doesn't care, then I have to fix this. We have a theological issue. God does care. Peter tells us that right here. If you believe this is the inerrant word of God, then all of it's inerrant. There's no mistakes anywhere in it. And that means that God cares about you. The end. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. He cares about you. Here's step four. Don't be naive. It's pretty simple. But there's a lot of truth here because this principle acts 
as a counterbalance. We are to cast our cares on him, but we're not told to be careless about it. We're not told to, to just walk away because the opposite is true. What does he say next? We should keep an eye out for who? The enemy. The enemy is prowling around. And, and let me just be honest with you. When it comes to the devil, we have a really weird view of who the devil is. We have a really weird view of the enemy. Because we, we typically go to one of two extremes, right? Either A, we think the devil's hiding behind every single bush and he's going to get us. Or we, we pay him no attention at all and we don't take him seriously. And very rarely do we land theologically in the middle to what we're, we're learning here. Listen to me. Satan is a powerful enemy. I love the shirt that says Satan is a nerd. I agree. But he's a very powerful enemy. Look at verse 8. Listen to what Peter says. Remember, inerrant. It's true. Every word. Be sober-minded. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Do you know that Satan walks around looking for your weakest point and that's what he attacks? You realize that? What's that word? In a, in a minute, I can't say it. Somebody says it. Who said it? There it is. Anonymity. <laughs> I can't say it. My tongue doesn't work that fast. I don't know. I can roll my R's, but I can't say that word. That, that's his greatest tool. Let me get you alone. Let me begin to tell you little lies about how you're not worthy, about how it doesn't work, and let me give you your own little pity party and just destroy you as best I can. I can't take you, right? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I can't rip you from his hands, but I can sure make your life miserable, and that's what he does. He walks around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. You ever been to the zoo and heard a lion roar? Whew. We went to the Columbus Zoo a couple months ago, and you could hear it literally across the zoo. And all this one was doing was going, rrr, rrr. we could hear it all the way across the zoo. I was like, I want to go see this. Like, this is going to be epic. This is going to be incredible. And we get over, and he's just walking around, just pacing. Rrr. But you heard it all the way across the zoo. Good night. I've never heard one actually roar. That would be amazing. That's how Satan is described in verse 8. It may be an area of temptation for you. He's going to come find it. He's going to give it to you. He's going to entice you with it. Just come here, just come here, come here. It might be a bad habit. Oh, don't worry about it. Everybody has their habits. You just keep doing that one. God's going to forgive you, right? It may be an ongoing sin. Well, you've done it this long. Might as well not stop. Might as well just keep going. Like, right? It's all these little things that he does to us. So be alert. Be on watch. Don't let your guard down for even a moment. Peter describes him as our adversary. And so his plan is to hit you right when you're at your weakest moment. Verse 9, he says, resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. No. See, your trial is unique. No one really understands that because nobody's going through what you're going through. Well, that's not what Peter tells me. The same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers Throughout the world, listen to me, you're not alone. You're not going through this alone. You're, you're not the only one. And so verse 9 reveals a twofold strategy for defeating Satan's attack. And if you know I like the meat, here's the meat. This whole thing's kind of application, right? Five steps. But let me give you like where the rubber really meets the road. So if you're a note taker and this is one of those areas that you're struggling with, he, listen, here's where it comes from. A twofold strategy. Resist. And remember, Verses, verse 9, resist and remember. Verse 9 says, resist him. By how? By standing firm in the faith. Not my words, Peter's words. I wish I'd have thought of them, but Peter did. He wrote them. I didn't. That means standing firm on the truth of Scripture. 
That means understanding that when your Bible is telling you to go through certain things and, and navigate your way through them, just, just navigate the way the Bible says to do it. Stand firm in the faith. What did Jesus do when he was tempted in the wilderness? Where did he turn? To Scripture. All right. He didn't turn to his disciples. He didn't turn to his friends. He didn't turn to Mary and Martha and all that. He went straight to the Word of God. And he is God. <laughs> so if God can go to the Word of God, where do you think we should go? Thank you. Somebody's listening. Here's the second one. Remember. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that there's not a single temptation that we are powerless against. Listen to what he says in verse 13. No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. Wow, I think that Peter just said that in verse 9. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. So resist Satan's temptation, resist his ploys, resist his attack, and remember who fights for you. Remember who fights for you because he talks about him about like a roaring lion. But how is God described? He is a roaring lion. I'm going to go with the one who is the roaring lion, not who's one who's like him. Little bitty words in Scripture that we just blow right over. Like a warrant. He's not a roaring lion, folks. He's like one, but he's not one. God is. Amen. And God will chew him up. I want to see that fight one day. I'm just telling you. I used to go to a Saturday night Bible study. It was like this MMA Bible study. This guy in our church did a blast. We'd eat all this food, and then we'd watch. I was like, I'm just preparing for heaven one day when I get to watch the lion destroy the like a lion. Step five. Trust the promise. Trust the promise. How, how do you handle the days of stress and times of uncertainty? Peter says, look beyond the present to the future. Here in verses 10 and 11, he talks about after you've suffered for a little while, look what he says. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. Why couldn't he have done it before we suffered? I don't know. I didn't write it. To him be dominion forever. Amen. Listen to me. 70 years, average lifespan on earth maybe? I don't know. Compared to what's unfolding ahead of us in eternity forever and ever and ever? That means sickness now and healing later. Well, how long will I be healed? Forever. That's rejection now and acceptance forever. That's failure now and excess, success forever. That's the persecution of evil men now and the praise of God later. How about the, the crown? Well, I'll say the badge, the badge of shame now. Tomorrow, the crown of glory. I'm looking for that. I'm looking for that, folks. What does Scripture tell us? Weeping endures for a night, but joy comes when? In the morning. Tomorrow's a new day. My tomorrow, on the other side of the river, is forever. It's forever. So Peter uses four words I want to point out to you. To describe what God will do for those who suffer. Look in verse 10. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. He'll restore you. God himself will make up anything you lack. Think about that. He says he'll restore you. He, he will establish you. He, he's going to sustain that which is weak. The very next word, strengthen you. 
God himself will give you every bit of strength that you need to complete whatever task it is that's ahead of you. And he finally says that he will support you. He'll put you on a firm foundation. That's a, a phrase that goes all throughout Scripture. The Living Bible translates that last part of verse 10 this way. It says, he will personally come and pick you up and set you firmly in place and make you stronger than ever. Why did God do all that? Because of four little words. He cares about you. He's the God of all grace. Not just some grace, all grace. He created grace. He is grace. That means that no matter what suffering it is that you're going through, that God will provide the grace necessary to endure it and finally get to the good stuff that's on the other side. He'll restore you, he'll establish you, he'll strengthen you, and he will support you after you have suffered for a little while. You know what the truth there in verse 11 is, or verse 10? He won't leave you there. That's the promise of Scripture. I don't know how long a little while is, folks. I have no idea. But the promise is, is after we've suffered for a little while, he's coming for us. He's coming. You know what the Bible calls this? Jesus. It's Christ. Do you know Christ? Let's pray. Father, that's a lingering question. Do we know your son Jesus? My goal is that not just everybody in this room would know Jesus, but everybody that I would come into contact with, I would be a light that your son Jesus is real and they would be able to get in to see how badly they need him. And so Holy Spirit, I just ask you this morning, is there anybody in this room who doesn't know Jesus? I don't know that. You do. Listen to me. If you don't know Jesus, then probably this doesn't make a lot of sense to you this morning. Maybe you've been suffering and you don't understand why. I'd love to talk to you about it. I'd love to sit down with you and, and, and take you to Scripture and show you the truth of about how God brings us closer to Him. He draws us in when we go through suffering. Sometimes we suffer because of our own mistakes. I get that. But when you know Jesus, then you understand it's only for a little while. Do you know Jesus this morning? Have you ever surrendered your life to King Jesus? And if you haven't, would you be willing to do that today? If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ and you want to, I'm not going to embarrass you. People are here all the time hear me say this every week. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm not going to ask you to come down here to the front of the stage, but I'm going to ask you just to Put your hand in there so I can see you. Nobody else is looking around, but I want to know who you are because I want to follow up with you. Praise God. See, you're one. Anybody else? Would you have this conversation with God? Would you say, Lord, I'm sorry. I mess up time and time again. Like everybody else in the room, I'm a sinner but my sins are unforgiven. Would you forgive me for my sins today, Lord? I come before you and I surrender my life to you today. Would you save me? The amazing promise in Scripture is that if you have that conversation with God and you mean it deep in your heart, as Paul tells us about in Romans confess your mouth, but believe it in your heart, then you're saved. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. These truths that we just walked through, those are your truths. 
Behold, the old is dead and the new has come. You're a brand new creation in Christ. You're no longer the same person you were when you walked in the room. Some of you are struggling. I get it. Some of you are fighting some battles that you don't want to fight. Stop fighting them. Cast your cares upon God because he cares about you. God, let that be the truth today that we walk away with. Let that be the truth that we can go and share with somebody else. Maybe we're not the ones struggling, but there's people we know who are. And so God, maybe we take them to 1 Peter chapter five and show them how much you care about them and what you will do when we cast our cares upon you, when we just throw it on you with vigor. Father, thank you for your promises and thank you for your truth. I pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Before uh, Bethany comes up, one quick thing I want to share with you. Um, last week, I had the privilege to uh, baptize Emily in our church. I don't know where Emily is. Emily in here still? She's, oh, there she is, right here. Woohoo! Um, Emily uh, has been attending our church for a little while, and you'll hear some of this in video, but um, has really been wrestling with asking some God questions, some really good God questions. Grew up in a Mormon background and um, just realized that's not truth. And uh, started hearing truth and surrendered her life to Jesus. And so we got to baptize her at um, her husband's Pawpaw's farm, um, who passed away there last fall in a, in a tragic accident. It wasn't like he was old and ready to go. He just it was an accident on the farm. And so at his funeral, uh, she finally surrendered her life to Jesus. Incredible. And so she's like, yeah, absolutely. So she was like, can I get baptized at the farm at the lake? And I'm like, yeah. So since y'all weren't there, we brought it to you guys. So check this out. Emily started attending our church, her and Noah, probably about a year and a half ago. And then came and met with my wife and I and just started talking about faith and the Christian faith and had a lot of questions and wasn't really sure and so for weeks and months, she was asking more questions, and then at Paul's funeral, gave her life to Christ. And so, sad day for that, and then what a glorious day, and I told her, what a, what a way to give honor to Paul. Mm -hmm. So, she wanted to get baptized right here, because this was his spot. So, we're excited, I'm honored to be here. And so, Emily, are you committed to serving Christ with your life every single day of your life? Awesome. It is my privilege to baptize you as my sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in a brand new life. There's rock. Good? Okay. All right. Amen. Congratulations to Emily again on her baptism. Um, I want to say happy Father's Day to all of the fathers in the room. We're glad you could be here to celebrate with us today. A couple quick reminders. Um, Sunday, this coming up Sunday is Married Night. If you have not registered for our Married Night Out, please do so. It's going to be a really, really great event. Um, we have a new info table out in the lobby. I'm sure many of you guys have seen it. Um, that is going to be kind of become our information hub. It'll be a place where you can register for events, get more information. Um, it will typically have a laptop on it today. It does not. Um, but normally that is where you're going to go to be able to register for events. Since we do not have the laptop here today, we did post the link for registration on both our public and our private Facebook pages. So if you go to the Facebook page, you can sign up for Married Night, and then we can make sure that you guys are ready to go and you're accounted for. Um, next week, you're also going to be finding some of these guest invite cards in your worship folder. We have them kind of scattered around the church in different locations. Please take some and bring them and invite people. When you're out in the community, you're talking to someone. If you think that they might be a really great fit here at the Durant Community Church, you can give them one of these. It has all of our information. Um, but next week, they will be in your worship folder. So you just be aware that you're going to be getting those next week. But you can always grab more. Um, for those of you who give, we do have boxes on the back. You can also give online at thisisthejourney.org. Um, as our fathers leave today, we have a special gift for you. And it's going to be right out here in the hall. We're thankful you're here, and we hope you have a good week.